you're very lucky um, in, in the department to have uh, two visiting artists, graphic designers, um, Dermot McCormick and Patricia McElroy, who are from Philadelphia. I'll just read this um, to, to go over some of the things that they have done, and again, to talk about how fortunate we are to have them here today. Uh, Dermot and Patricia earned their, uh, their degree in art and design in the National College of Art and Design in Dublin, Ireland. They worked for a number of years in various design studios, both in Ireland and Philadelphia, before founding uh, 21X Design in 1997. Their company is a visual communications design studio specializing in brand support across the visual spectrum. This includes print, web, and interact interactive design solutions. Their work has been honored with international and national awards for design excellence, and their work has been published in graphic design industry standards such as Graphis, Communication Arts, a magazine, the Print Magazine, Regional Design Annual, HAL Magazine, the Society of Publication Design, to name but a few. Their work has been featured in books, including <coughs> Type Rules, the new big book of layouts, Graphic Design Solutions, fourth edition, and the book Design School Confidential, Extraordinary Class product, Projects from International Schools, Colleges, and Institutions. Their work has been exhibited throughout the US, uh, including the Republic of Ireland, England, Australia, the Ukraine, and Russia. Uh, what this all means is that um, they are well known in the industry, and again, we are very fortunate to have them here today to talk about their process and about the area of graphic design. Uh, Dermot McCormick is also a published author and is Associate Professor of Graphic and Interactive Design at the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. Um, both Dermot and Patricia can lead tall buildings in a single bound as well. <laughs> Uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to our visiting artists and uh, my friends, graphic designers Dermot McCormick and Patricia Mackle. Thank you. Thank you. you can hear me okay? Yeah. Is it on? I don't know if it's on. It's recording. Uh, okay. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, delighted that. Uh, the university has invited us here today and we'd like to thank uh, Tom especially for the invitation to come here and talk to you today. Some of you may or may not know that actually uh, Tom was one of my students many, many moons ago. That's why he's so good. <laughs> and uh, Tom also worked in our studio for a little bit after he graduated uh, before coming here. So we go back a long way with Tom and he's a great designer, great energy and uh, we still miss him in the studio. So um, he's a great guy. So uh, today, um, Patricia and myself are going to talk um, a little bit about our work, but we're going to split the talk up into uh, two parts. Kind of the first part will be about um, early influences, um, going back to college days and what we were influenced by. Uh, as Tom mentioned earlier, we did uh, both study in, in uh, Dublin and Ireland before, and we worked there for a little bit before we moved to the States. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that but that transition from studying over there and working over there and coming over here. Uh, and then we'll also, then the second part of the talk is about um, the work in 21X Design and, and the kind of problems that we've uh, encountered along the way. But the overall theme of the talk is leading a creative life. So what we've tried to do uh, over the many years we've been in, in this business is to uh, lead a creative uh, life where we're doing meaningful work and uh, what we want to talk today about is the path that we have taken or the various paths that we have taken over the years to get where we are today because uh, it's not always a linear thing and uh, sometimes you know we get distracted with one kind of decision we end up doing one thing or uh, we end up doing something else but sometimes you have to like stop and take stock of what you're doing and then go back to your original plan, as it were, what you wanted to do. So you'll see today there's lots of different kinds of work and um, we'll just start off by yeah, early influences. So this is the, um, and you can just chip in whenever you want. Um, this is the college where we studied, um, it's called the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. It was founded in 1746. Uh, we actually, when we were there, the college was actually in the process of moving, so this is the third building we actually lived in. Uh, very conveniently located, just about a uh, five minute walk down the road from Guinness Brewery, which is very handy. And it, this building itself was actually part of a distillery at one time back in the 1800s. So it's a pretty interesting building and that's what we studied. So um, 
when we were in college, of course, uh, we didn't have uh, computers, the internet, so uh, we basically lived in the library. And that was really our, we, our source for all kinds of information. We just absorbed as many different kinds of inspiration as we can find. So we weren't just limited to looking at graphic design. We were looking at uh, paintings, um, illustration, movies. We're big movie fans. These are some movies that you know, we really like, for example, like 2001. Many of you guys here have seen 2001? A few, OK. Um, you know, How about Blade Runner? Blade Runner, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome movie, you know. And, it, and you know, these, these uh, movies like Tarkovsky, you know, going back up there a sec. Whoops. Um, like movies like this, you know, before I went to college, I never heard of uh, Tarkovsky, who's a uh, famous, was a famous um, Russian uh, movie director. But all these things, they all feed into this big pool of inspiration for us. And, um, and of course, when we were in college, um, we were, happened to be there right smack in the middle when the punk movement was starting. So it was a great time to be in, in the university. Very exciting times. The music was great. You know, people like Talking Heads, Jai Division, um, Wire, all these people. Um, really, it was just an exciting time to be in, in a university at the time. And, um, but of course, we did. Um, look at other designers as well. And a big inspiration for both of us was Japanese design. And this guy here, Iko Tanaka, uh, was one of our early discoveries, I guess. In the library, we happened to find this book on Japanese design that we'd never seen before. And this guy just blew me away. Just, uh, you know, we just never seen anything quite like this. Uh, actually, incidentally, years later, I happened to get the opportunity to teach in uh, TUJ in uh, Rome, at Temple University of Rome, or uh, uh, Tokyo campus, sorry. And I got to see a retrospective of Iko Tanaka's work. He had died the year before. It was really pretty amazing. Uh, also, um, literature is a big thing for us. Um, and this is a book that one of my professors gave me um, on Zen and Zen teachings and philosophy and actually had a big influence uh, on me as well. So we're always, we're always you know, open to different influences and literature being one of them. And you'll see an example later on what something that came out of this directly, so. So uh -huh. this is um, just, uh, we still collect as much as we can possibly collect information-wise. Visually, um, our house is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> We have nowhere else to store books. <laughs> Too many um, books. Yeah. This book we would have loved. This mm. is uh, an example of you know a, a book that we saw in Rome in um, uh, the uh, Piazza di San Marco. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, where Fra Angelico has all all the work, and uh, we were working on a project which you'll see later on. That um, we just wanted to steal this book for it. It just uh, it was so inspiring. Um, so it it. It continues today, and that's um, part of, I guess, what we mean by l living a creative life. Um, keeping the passion for what you want to do alive. And, you know, right now at college, you're probably, you're full of that passion for what you're doing. Um, as you leave college and move on, the question is, how do you, how do you fuel that? How do you keep that going? Um, well, it happens through uh, what's going to happen to you, all the decisions you make along your way. Um, you know, we've had uh, a number of things that have changed our minds on things, moved us forward, moved us back. But uh, the one thing we always keep striving for is that we, we know we want to stay creative. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of thing that fuels that. And stay open to inspiration wherever you're going to find it. So. Uh, and then we've put in some uh, work from our college days. Um, this, um, the college we went to uh, at the time was, I guess, a, a liberal arts training. And what we did was primarily focused on illustration, a lot of illustration work with some design. We didn't have much topography at the time, um, but we did um, enjoy lots of illustration, uh, conceptual uh, work. Uh, like this piece here was, you want to talk about that one? Like, um, uh, this was part of my thesis project at college. Uh, the college was situated in a very, um, very old part of Dublin. 
um, that had a lot of character to it, um, a lot of stories. Um, my project was dealing with the character and the stories and illustrating uh, the people in the community of the, the area. And then <laughs> we graduated in a recession times. <laughs> so uh, we worked for a number of years in uh, Ireland and then decided that let's see what's happening on the other side of the water. So we headed 3,000 miles west and uh, came to Philly where we had family and um, sort of set up, set up shop here in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, we found freelance work. We, we lugged our portfolios around, which were massive at the time. <laughs> and, yeah, um, people didn't really know what to do with us because we didn't have portfolios like the portfolios that were here. So uh, that was a struggle. Um, mm. So it was, it was a very conflicted time trying to discover, trying to learn and trying to discover where we fit in and what we wanted to do. Mm. Uh, we found we found work in studios, freelance work mostly. Um, and we also found side projects that we could get involved in. This was one of those. Um, this was a, a nights and weekends project. Uh, labor of love. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Labor of love. Everybody that worked on Scan Magazine, um, it was their first experience in publishing. So we all learned together. It, this magazine was um, uh, free and found at most of the colleges in Philadelphia. And, and one thing we didn't have a lot of from college was uh, a lot of uh, type uh, classes, actually very little type, because at the time, to, do any, to actualize anything in type, you needed to have access to printing technology. You know, we didn't have computers, so all the stuff you see in here is all done by hand. It's all cut and pasted. So uh, for us, working on this publication was a real learning experience. We really learned an awful lot about working with topography and working with grid systems and learning on the job, you know, putting in long hours, late hours to uh, realize these different projects. So, um, so we learned in our own way how to deal with um, typography, photography, illustrators, um, how to art direct. Um, it was all uh, mostly done in our own time with um, freelance projects. Um, we held down nine to five jobs while we did this, while we gained this experience, and um, then tried to move that into, I guess, the more mainstream, mm -hmm. where we could actually hold a job that, um, you know, would allow us to be creative and earn money at the same time. Right. <laughs> And some of the studios uh, I worked in, uh, I guess I, for a long time I, I ended up more like doing corporate kind of work for corporate clients. Uh, this is an example of one of them. Uh, usually these kind of projects um, were, you know, had pretty hefty budgets. Uh, you could work with different illustrators. This is Philippe we we Weisbecker from Paris, who was the illustrator. And um, you know, for a time I enjoyed it. Uh, it was good. And, um, some projects give you more um, flexibility than others, like this one here is for Letraset. If any of you guys know who, what Letraset is, it used to be the, anyone know? No. Uh, before you could set type, you actually could, you know, you get these sheets of type and you rub down the type, rub down type. And that's how you comped up things. So uh, when digital technology started taking over topography, uh, Letraset was one of the first people to try and jump on that and basically digitize all their information. So this was like a DVD package that you could buy all the fonts on the, on the DVD package. So this, this folded out. Yeah. So working in the, in the publishing area um, with Scan Magazine uh, gave me a love for um, magazines. Um, late 80s, early 90s, was, um, it was magazine heaven. Um, it was when magazines were thriving. There were more magazines out there than at any other time in, um, uh, in the past 50 years. Uh, Neville Brody was a huge influence with uh, his magazine, The Face. And um, we would spend hours upon hours in magazine shops and bookshops. That's where we got our education then. Um, now it would be the internet. Uh, but this was a, it was a very physical thing to pick up the magazine or the book and um, discover what the newest layout was going to be every month. 
And in our different studios too, we looked up to when we, you know, when we came to the States, so two of them especially was Pentagram in New York, and also uh, Vinelli Associates, which I think is the next one. Uh, and both of these studios we admired because they uh, did a very wide range of work and weren't afraid of tackling different kinds of things. They weren't just doing just annual reports or just publications. And we really liked that idea that you could actually one day possibly have a business where we could do lots of different kinds of things and not be stuck in one thing. So we really looked up to uh, Vanelli Associates too. I mean, they were also husband and wife team, which we kind of thought was pretty cool. And, um, and then this is... Well, um, my, uh, I guess, evening and weekends at SCAN turned into a full-time job as an art director of Philadelphia magazine, um, where I worked for a number of years. Uh, that, was, that brought everything together for me. Um, it brought photography, illustration, typography. Um, it was a, a really exciting time. Uh, and I was able to um, hone my skills as uh, a magazine and, and publishing designer. Well, one thing that's great about this kind of work too that, uh, is you're working with photographers. You know, some of these uh, photo shoots were you know, day long, maybe two days long, where you're working with lots of different people and making sets and art directing, all these different things. It was really a fun time to uh, to be working in the magazine field, so because you get to work with lots of different kinds of people. So we came to a point um, which, and uh, we were just talking about this at lunch, where I guess the first ten years after you graduate, um, you go in so many different directions, and you you sort of you grasp them as they come to you. There's no uh, very few people have a linear progression towards what they want to do. Um, it's grabbing opportunity. It's um, because there's so many things that are unknown. Um, you learn as you go, so you discover new things and you follow that. If you don't like it, you follow it, go in another direction. So, by the time we reached, um, uh, by the time I reached Philadelphia Magazine and Dermot in um, some of the Philadelphia studios. Uh, we had, um, at that stage, we had had a certain amount of experience. We really thought about, okay, what's the next step? And this is where the creative li slash life conflict comes into play. Um, we were ready to have a fam start a family. Um, New York was calling because that is the mecca for publishing. It was then, it still is. Um, what did we want to do? We had friends, family here in Philadelphia. Um, we had, um, you know, people that we worked with a lot. Uh, we didn't really want to leave, so we were we waited up. Could we do this? Could we still be creative and stay in Philadelphia, living in the shadow of New York? Well, we decided to do that, and um, the vehicle we used was starting our own business, uh, and that's what we did. Twenty One X Design, um, where we wanted to work. With, um, with clients that were interested in working with us, not, interest as, not as interested in having us do their bidding, but interested in collaborating with us. Right. So we purposely sought out to find clients that we could do that with. Um, and also to have a clientele that would uh, allow us to do a wide range of work, just like the stuff we showed with Pentagram and Vanelli, we're not doing one kind of thing. So these, these next couple of slides are examples of some of the recent projects we've been involved with. Um, this one is for a Philadelphia photographer, Vincent Feldman, and he has been photographing uh, old and abandoned buildings in Philadelphia for about 20 years. And one thing that we like to get involved with are projects is that are projects that are meaningful. They're not just look good, but there's a point and there's a purpose to them. And this project here, his, Vince's whole thing is that he's trying to uh, alert people in Philadelphia that we have all this wonderful architectural uh, history and legacy that's be basically been torn down and just abandoned and ripped apart. So um, this was a long project. I guess it took about a year and a half to complete. 
It's about, I don't know, 250 pages, like a big coffee table thing. <laughs> and what's great about it is, the, you know, we, it's um, all these big size images of all the all these photographs. And then as you flip through the book, at the end of it, it gives these great little histories of all these actual places, all these buildings. And then one thing that we, we like to do, too, is in our studio is where we can combine different kinds of technologies, whether it's print technology or interactive technology. So this here is a kind of a sneak peek at the, there's going to be a companion iPad that's going to go along with the book. So you'll be able to see the image and then click on the little icons at the bottom and, and actually see a live map of where that building is. And then you'll be able to go and see it if you want to do. So it's a way of extending the information that's in the book to uh, actually go and see the real thing. And that's the an image. Actually, this, this place here is where one of the buildings was. And now it's a CVS or something. So, but it's a kind of an idea to show you that I think since the book, since we started the book, as I can say, it took about a year, year and a half. I think he said that about 30% of the buildings had been gone by the time the book came out. So they're going at a rapid rate. Um, well, this is an example of a book that um, didn't exactly turn out as we expected. Uh, <laughs> this book, uh, we spent a long time um, designing it, laying it out, producing it, um, sent it off to the client who was a publisher, and um, only to be told that they had to shrink the whole thing, <laughs> and they didn't even want to show it to us when it was printed. In other words, they shrunk it without <laughs> us. You know. So they just crammed this big book into like a little book. So yeah, you can imagine the results. But this is, you know. And we are both very interested in history, and we always have been. So we thought this is a great opportunity to work on a book that's a, it's essentially a um, history of World War II for teenagers. So it's a way of condensing information and uh, simply and putting it all together. Unfortunately, the. Uh, yeah, you can't scrunch this kind of a layout into half a size of the box, so. but it is what it did look like at one stage. So, yeah. uh, it, it also taught us that um, projects don't always turn out the way you think they're going to turn out. Mm -hmm. right. uh, sometimes they turn out better, sometimes they don't turn out as well. Mm -hmm. um, they're always a learning experience, so you can always take something from them um, and move on to the next project and improve on it. And that's part of the whole collaborative process, too, that sometimes you have to work, like in a, in a publishing condition. For example, that other book, the photography book, you know, we're always working with the photographer. He's trying to get the best looking book. He's trying to get the biggest images, the biggest book. The publisher's trying to get the smaller book, less expensive to produce. So there's always this tension going on. You're just trying to manage it and keep it all afloat and make it look as good as you can. So sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. You know. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes we do books where there isn't a lot to work with. You know, the, the publisher just says, here, I have this book, you know, make it look good, do something with it. And this, as it turned out, that this is an older book. It was written in, initially, it's a reprint written in the 1930s. And it turned out that the guy was a big fan of a constructivist, Russian constructivist type. So we said, hey, we'll just do something with that. And then, you know, they liked that, so. Uh, we also try to include illustration wherever we can. So these two uh, examples, these are um, reprints of older books, um, but these are illustrations that you know, we try to introduce into the different design as much as we can. And as you can see, we don't try to pin one particular style. We try to make the design appropriate to the problem at hand. So we always think that the solution is actually in the problem somewhere. You just have to kind of find it. But uh, it's appropriate and um, you know, if what, it works. Yeah, what that means to us is that the, the style also has to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't set a standard style for a studio and say that you know, everything fits into this. Uh, we really intuitively let the project and the client help lead us towards what the answer might be. Uh, and that's um, Unless also we think they're leading us the wrong way, <laughs> which sometimes happens too. But. Mm. 
Uh, pollsters, um, it's not something we get to do a lot of, um, uh, but when we do get the opportunity, we, we jump on it if we can. And uh, as Patricia mentioned earlier, we try to do different kinds of things and not just graphic design, so to keep our interests broad. So I think Tom mentioned earlier, I do some writing. Uh, so this is the play that I, that I wrote and got produced as part of the Fringe Festival in Philadelphia. And then, as, of course, hey, I'll design the poster as well. So, you know, these different kind of opportunities come up and you just have to kind of run with them. And, um, and in this case, too, we also did, well, you're not seeing it here, we also did the identity for the uh, theatre company as well. So, so uh, this, is, this is years after uh, when we began, we did daytime work, we did nighttime work, we did weekend work all as creative as possible. Um, so years on, um, even when we've become more established, we're still doing that because it's hard work to keep up that, that creative um, uh, passion mm -hmm. that, that you want to. And we have so many ideas that we want to get out there, but you have to work at them. Uh, because when you leave them to one side, uh, they either get stale or somebody else does them. <laughs> which you will find quite often. You'll have mm -hmm. an idea, and then a couple of months later, or even years, if you haven't done anything it's about out it, there. somebody else has done it. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like they heard you mention it. So it's important, uh, it, it's important for us to, to keep those fires burning and, and keep our hand in and um, do that work on the side. In Dermot's case, it's writing. In my case, it's photography. Mm -hmm. um, while we're still working together and designing material in the studio. And also we try to collaborate as much as we can on different projects. And Pulses is one good opportunity for that because, you know, Patricia will do this uh, photography. She's a, a vast library of images that we can use for uh, different things. So uh, this is for a workshop in Japan and it was a combination of illustration and photography. So wherever we can, we try to collaborate as much as we can on, on a given project. Hey, this one here uses hand illustration and photography combined. So, and we're a lot of fun doing this one. Um, this is an annual show that happens at, at uh, Temple University and uh, it's a pl always a play on the number. So this case here, we were at the time, I forget, oh, you were doing some night photography. At the time I was interested in night yeah. photography. Yeah. Yeah. Patricia, Patricia was uh, doing night classes in night photography and we came across this technique of you know trying to do things by it's like a, a torch right a wand a yeah. wand yeah and um, to make Just the, the tent flashlight yeah. yeah and as somebody said to me this is probably the last time I'd, I'd be able to do this particular solution because these <laughs> CDs DVDs no more but it was perfect for us so yeah and sometimes the solution, like I say, is right there in the problem itself. So uh, uh, another client that we collaborate really well with is um, Mainline Health, which has a number of hospitals in Philadelphia. Um, they are a perfect client for us because they really respect what we can do for them, so they listen. And when we told them that um, they had to stop using stock images for their magazines, that they had um, a ready-made community within their own hospital systems, um, and that they needed to let us direct a photographer uh, and show them what their hospitals are made of. Um, they listened. So we produce um, magazines for them a number of times a year, and we do a number of photo shoots with them um, each year to sort of build up their own natural stock of images. Uh, this was actually the last issue we did because they opened a new heart institute. So they really want to show it, wanted to show it at its best. Um, yeah, and one thing that this particular publication has been very successful with, I think, is helping to build a community within this huge hospital system. And the people that work there you know, they wait for this thing to come out and they want to see the photographs in there and it gives, it really has built, or helped to build a very strong community within the hospital system. And it's definitely a case, I mean, Patricia does most of the art direction on the photography, you know, you're, 
it's very high intensity um, photo shoots, sometimes photographing things in uh, tense situations. And so the, um, the book that I showed you earlier from Rome, this is the project that it, it um, we had already started this when we were on that trip and saw that book and knew we were on the right track. <laughs> um, so this, is, um, this project has been in the works for about four years. Um, again, lucky enough to have the perfect client. Uh, he, um, his family created this uh, role-playing game and they wanted to bring it to life. Uh, so we've been working with them to do that. And it has involved two books, uh, three websites, um, branding, uh, and it just it will go on and on since they're, they're mm -hmm. at the very beginning of launching it. Uh, the books will be printed finally at the end of May. Um, but they've been um, uh, they've been in the works for a long time. Yeah, and and they've been working on this project, I think, for twenty years. It, yes, like it's, it's really a <coughs> lifetime project for them and right. their kids who are now in the working world. <laughs> yeah. um, and they're bringing the game to their friends, and uh, they're about to launch on a new marketing strategy to make it more popular and uh, get it out there to the public. So this book explains the game and all the characters. <clears throat> they commissioned all these wonderful illustrations, different people. They created a world for the game, and these are the creatures that live in the world. There's also 10 races that live in the world. Um, the world is called Tamara. And the rule book is 300 pages long. Anybody who's familiar with role-playing games will know that that's probably yeah, normal. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> we I mean, were not. Like Lord of the Rings so or something. It's just so. Uh, it's detailed. amazing the amount of detail that uh, you can get into with these games. But that is one thing that people do hire us for. I think is working with information. How do, like, they just had all this huge amounts of information, and how do you distill all that information and make it? palatable for people that they can read it and get through it and so that's one thing we're definitely um, asked to do a lot. And uh, I forget what program they had done the map in originally but it was a series of uh, lines and rules and we took it and developed it into you know talking to them about what the different areas of the continent would look like, what would the trees be like here, what would the landscape be like there. Um, would it suit the, the, we asked them a lot of questions. What would the character, this character live in? So as we move forward, we're going to be developing that world even more by answering questions that they hadn't even really thought of. Um, they thought of the game. Now they're thinking about the world and who's going to live in it and how they'll live in it. So it's, um, it's opening up new areas for them to develop as well as ourselves. And then there is some... Um... There's uh, the website, there's two parts to the website. The um, fnbgames.com is the, the website that tells you about the company that produces the game, the, the role-playing game. Um, I can't get over. It features the people involved, uh, the products, what's going to be available to purchase. And then the second part of it is called Beyonder, and that takes you into the world of the game and uh, gives you a flavor of uh, what the world is about, who lives there, um, what they can do, um, sort of introducing you to some of the, the things that you would, the people, the creatures, and the, um, I guess, the talents that uh, you would come across if you played the game.
So that's an example of um, just a snippet of one of the um, animations for that. And then there's a, um, the games website itself. So, um, like I just mentioned earlier, uh, one thing that we do get asked to do a lot is to take complex information and make it uh, readily available for people to use. And this is an example of that. This is a website. Just going to show you a little bit of it. But it's a, um, <clears throat> a renovated 18th century farmhouse in Bucks County. And it has 50 acres of these incredible gardens. And they wanted to basically do an interactive map of the garden so people could go on the website and kind of get a flavor of what was going on in the garden. So that's, that's what this is here. So, um, moving on to uh, illustration, uh, which we try and do uh, as much as possible. Um, these were a series of, uh, this was an unusual assignment for us. We were asked by um, an international newspaper that had a, um, a writer in the States that was going to be traveling around for six weeks. Uh, they wanted us to illustrate a story every week. So we would get our script uh, from the writer um, on probably a Sunday, Sunday night. night, and we had to have something done by Tuesday so that I could get printed. So it was, um, so each thing was done really fast, each illustration, and uh, they were a lot of fun to do. Um, but it was certainly, um, it was a great experience and a very interesting way of working. Um, normally we'd have more lead time than that, especially for an illustration. <laughs> But it was fun to work under those tight deadlines and uh, keeping your toes. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing as good for idea generation as having to work <laughs> under a major deadline. Mm -hmm. um, this is some of the photography that I try and do uh, for myself. Um, it, it comes from my travels, it comes from everyday life. Um, uh, I try and do different things with it. Um, this particular series is putting together a narrative from um, images that don't appear to actually go together and are, that are from different parts of the world. So we're always taking images, always, right? always collecting images too. And this was a series from um, uh, working with night 
some of my night photography. And who knows, sometimes you might be able to use some of this imagery in a, in a project too. So we're always trying to experiment and keep that part of what we do alive. Uh, in Dermot's case, he likes to experiment in the interactive area. So this, this is the project that we did um, with this um, pianist, and uh, she had a traveling, um, this performance was around the country, like Philadelphia, New York, San Francisco, and she wanted to do a, um, an interactive installation that went along with the music. So. We designed and developed um, this uh, video projection um, that essentially works off the music. So it's programmed so that um, it doesn't do anything if there's no music playing. And then depending, depending on what she's playing, what the pitch and what the volume, it creates this artwork on the fly in a generative way. So it's not predetermined. You know, we kind of set up all the parameters. And then once the music and the programming starts to work together, it just takes off and does its, does its thing. So let's show you a little bit of the uh, short little excerpt of this. Hopefully we'll be able to see it okay. So what was interesting about that performance was that they, um, where to go? Was that the uh, it was never the same thing twice. So each time she played that, that whole thing looks different, completely different. Uh, but it was a great great opportunity to work directly with the performer, and to try something experimental and do something a bit different. So, and that's the show. Anyone? Anyone have any questions? <laughs> any questions? I know all of you have some questions. Some at the back up there. Um, how do you call the point of time? Oh, that's a good question. Actually, I haven't answered that one in a long time. But there's a short version and a long version. I'll give you the short version. Somebody said to me, is, it, is that 21st century? And I go, yes. <laughs> but that's not the real story. The real story is I was in a, a studio, and I, like I said, I'm really interested in music, and this guy was working with me on a form a band. And uh, he wanted to call the band 23 Executioners. Don't ask me why, but we thought that was a cool name at the time. <laughs> so uh, the band never happened. It fell through. But I always kind of liked that name. And then we started using uh, 23 EX for certain things that we're doing. But then we, uh, when we started thinking about starting our own business, um, the numbers two and one have always been very lucky for us for, and lots of different things. Uh, like we met on the 12th, we were married on the 12th, our son was born on the 2nd or the 11th. So it always happens if Actually, numbers one and met two. met on the 21st. Oh, 21st, okay, there you go. And it's still a one and two. Uh, so that's where, the, that's where the number two and one came out. Then. So we make it, it was 21EX, and then we just shortened it to 21X. So that's, I guess that's why I didn't get an anniversary present right. this year. <laughs> I was off, yeah. Anyone else? I have yeah. a quick question. Maybe you could talk a little bit about this in terms of, oh, uh, um, just talk a little bit about uh, your collaborative process mm -hmm. when you get a project. How do you begin discussing um, 
what you might use in regards to type or what you might use in regards to imagery. How does that generate? How do you work um, in the studio together in, in that role? Who, who comes, who, where do you start, I guess? Yeah, well, I guess it depends on the project, right? I mean, lately, some of the projects we've been doing have been very complex. Like, uh, we've been doing a lot of WordPress sites lately, which, and some of them are pretty involved in like a big team of people. So, usually we will just uh, facilitate meeting of all the different people involved in it. And uh, then when it gets down to the nitty gritty of designing it, um, like Patricia may design something and I'll look at it and vice versa. Uh, we actually do have arguments over topography, which is kind of weird, but, uh, but we both have our likes and dislikes. And, uh, but I would say that anything that comes out of the studio, uh, both of us always has a hand at it in some shape or form. And nothing goes out without both of us approving it. Um, but sometimes, you know, like Patricia may have a project where she does the bulk of the work and I'm only kind of helping out and vice versa. So it's not always evenly split. Uh, we'll um, usually come together at the beginning of a project. Um, sometimes we, we might have preconceived notions of the feeling of the project. And uh, what's interesting is, you know, I might have a preconceived notion of the feeling I think the project should have, but Dermot or, you know, another designer might have another take on that, which I love because it, it, it offers a different point of view and you want to get as many point of views on a project as possible so that you can get to that common ground where something is going to work for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so we also might do a word wall. That's something we, we use a lot. Um, to develop inspiration, to develop ideas, and then go off in different directions with some of those, um, you know, directions. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you get along with your copywriters, especially if the project more advertising? Uh, uh, copywriters, um, it, depends. it depends on um, what role they play in the project. Uh, like for the magazine for, for Lankana, um, the copywriter was really a big part of the project. So the collaboration, you know, they just do their thing and give it to me. Um, and the collaboration worked very well. Um, if we hire a copywriter, we've usually worked for them before, with them before, so we're telling them what we need. And in that case, then, the client needs to approve you know what they're doing and what we want them to do so it's it becomes a little bit more complicated but um, in general uh, copywriters you know we've not usually had an awful lot of problems with copywriters mm, we actually like working with copywriters because we feel mm -hmm. that the, the copy is so critical the, the content is so critical mm -hmm. so if you have good copy it'll just make your piece so much better and uh, if the copy is bad it pulls it down so I think it's in everybody's interest to get the, the copy you know, well. So uh, wherever we can, if we can, we always try to hire someone that does a good job. And um, But even the people we don't get to hire them, uh, we always try to work closely with them if we can. Your creative process starts with you more visual than copy or? Not necessarily, no. Sometimes We it's like a... to get the copy. You know, if the copy, if copy exists, we'd like to get that first because it it really dictates it. to us what direction to, to bring the ideas in. Right. Uh, and if we don't have copy, then it's really important that we sit down with the client and hear what they have to say. Mm. Because uh, we definitely need, want the direction from them because they're, they're hiring us to do the project. Right. And we've had, we've had instances too where we've been given bad copy to work with. <laughs> and we have to go back to the client and persuade them to redo it or get someone else to redo it or you know so we do always try to push the project every time as much as we can and if some part of it's not right not working right we try to let the client know that and work with them to, to improve it so we have a project right now for a library system and they have no copy <laughs> yeah it's a nightmare <laughs> right. so we're, we're really going on verbal direction and leaving spaces for them to put in copy Mm -hmm. And it's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. But developers, on the other hand... <laughs> Any developers here? No? Programmers? Oh, nightmare, right? They can be a nightmare. A nightmare. Yes. yes. Yeah, we've, had a, we've had a rough year with developers. So 
we've had a few of them just go AWOL, so yeah, that seems to happen a lot. The question in the back? Uh, you've worked on like many different kinds of uh, like things in the art field, like illustration, right. photography, and all that. Which uh, like method do you prefer? Like, do you have the most fun with? Uh, well, actually, it's interesting that you ask that because uh, we don't often look back on the work that we've done. Um, so this was an opportunity to do that. It's not like we sit around saying, oh, remember what we did in 1983? <laughs> um, last month. So uh, going through this process has actually taught us something, um, and that is that we really do enjoy incorporating illustration and photography into the work, um, but very much illustration. Mm -hmm. um, that was a surprise to us. Um, we didn't think we had maybe used it as much as we have. Uh, so it's actually something that um, sort of woke up uh, an interesting point for us, and I think it's something that we're going to try and develop going forward. Mm. <laughs> what do you think is usually the most difficult part of the creative process for you, and how do you usually work around or through it? Uh, well, is it a, yeah. uh, I think the creative process is the, the <laughs> initial creative process is the easiest <clears> bit. <throat> to me, that's like the fun part of it, coming up with the ideas, coming up with the concept. Uh, it's actualizing those ideas and concepts that's the tough part, especially when you're working with lots of different kinds of people and depending on other people to help you realize those things. That's where the challenges can come in. But I think the initial part of any kind of project where you just coming up ideas and brainstorming and doing sketches and thumbnails and just word maps. To me, that's, that's the fun part. You know, I could do that all day if it was getting paid for it, it'd be great. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, once that's done and taken, how do you actually realize those things? How do you get them made? That's the really hard part, I think. Yeah. For me, it's the, um, I have to visualize it. If I can't visualize it, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, I have to batter it to death until I can visualize it. So if it's a complicated project, watch out, because I'm going to annoy the hell out of you until I understand every single thing about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's tough, too, because you may be working on projects that are very complex. So you could be like, say you were designing a website for a product that doesn't physically exist. It could be like a system or a process. How do you actually show that? Or, or if it's a... Um, a project where the client can't visualize it themselves and you can't show it to them unless you actually make the thing. So prototyping has become important for us. We have to kind of make things. We have to show them a little bit of it so they can see it working. Because a lot of times, uh, with, especially with new technologies, the people we work with, a lot of times they just can't see it. They just don't have the wherewithal to kind of visualize it. We might, but. Uh, they don't. So prototyping uh, has become much more important over the last few years, I would think. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, he's one in the back. Go ahead. No, you can go in the back. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, there's a you know the room here is full of undergraduates and, and graduate students and what would you say is an important attribute for those who are preparing um, to enter the field of the arts and in particular graphic design? What's an important um, element or, or um, thing for them to, to hold hold true to as they enter the, the field of graphic design or visual communication or in, in the workplace now, um, especially from the time where, you know, let's say the difference between 20 years to, to what is going on now. It's an important attribute you should have. Well, I think, I think for what, you know, from when we left college many moons ago, I think it's the same thing today. I think you have to be very persistent. Uh, you have to stay hungry. Uh, you have to know what you want and keep, out, keep at it. And uh, I think, speaking personally, I think that sometimes you get distracted by, you know, a cool job with lots of money, and then that happened to me once, and I got this, you know, I was very well paid. I was there a couple of months, and I absolutely hated it. And then I, I, after a few months, I just, I left, I quit. Because to me, the money was never the driving force. It was always the creative thing. So, um, always keep, my, keep your eye on the prize. You know, wh what do you want? You know, what kind of work do you want to do? Where do you want to be? 
in 10 years or 5 years or 15 years. So I've seen students where, you know, they leave college and they get this great job and they ask me what kind of benefits they should take. And I'm like, dude, you know, you, you need to look at the work yes. first, you know. <laughs> Worry about the pay and the benefits and all this stuff. That's secondary, you know. Uh, because what happens is sometimes students, they leave, they get into this a particular situation and they get stuck in a rut. It's great at the beginning, but then 10 years down the road, we see them, they actually come to the studio and they have no work in the portfolio. They can't show anything because they just spent 10 years doing something that they really didn't like. Mm. So I think that's important to kind of, um, you know, stay true to what you want to do and don't be distracted by these different things. If you can, obviously, you know, everyone's going to make a living and do meaningful work and, but I think there's, it's very also, easy to get distracted. I, I think that it's important um, to understand what's going on out there. Uh, be up to date on you know, Everything. what's yeah. going on in your field. Um, know who to contact. Um, when I arrived here, um, the first thing I did was I found the print regional annual. It gave me all the studios and agencies in Philadelphia, and that became my Bible. <laughs> um, you know, now there's the internet, um, but you can still, you, and you can see so much easier, instead of just seeing one piece in a magazine, now you can see a ton of stuff that's going on um, in any studio um, out there. Mm -hmm. So keep your eye on, on who you'd like to work with. Um, then you have a dialogue about what kind of work you want to do. Um, if you can see, you know, since you can see what's going on in, in the studios and the agencies out there. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's really important. And that helps you understand what direction to go in, what direction to send your portfolio in, um, and gives you, um, you know, gives you a goal instead of, you know, coming out of school and not knowing where to go, who to see what to do. And I think so. it's important too also to keep open-minded too as you go through your careers. I've seen people where they kind of you know, you fall into this thing and they kind of just close off other possibilities and especially with technology is driving a lot of what we do no matter what field you're in and I think if you're open to things and open to possibilities sometimes something may come up if you're open to it and you can grab it and it could be really interesting for your career, what you want to do, but if you're, if you're closed to things, so you, you, you just think oh, it can only be done this one way, then that can be detrimental to your career, I think. Yeah. You have a question in the back right there? Or? Um, obviously, through your, career, your careers, um, like a lot of your inspiration and, and interest change, mm -hmm. but I guess going back a ways prior to college, what like, Teacher just in arts in the first place. I was good at art at school. <laughs> My art teacher told me I was good at art. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know what graphic design was uh, until my middle of my first year in college. And I still didn't know what it was, but they said, you're a graphic artist. <laughs> or that would be a good area for you to go in. Mm. I, you know, just meandered until I discovered, yeah, you know what? Whatever this is, this is cool. Well, I th for me, I think you know, I was always interested in painting. I think when I went to college, I wanted to be a painter. That's what I thought I was going to be, was a painter. Uh, but I can clearly remember being in high school, senior year, and a teacher coming up to me. That was the first time I had art class was in my senior year. And the teacher said to me, uh, you know, you, you're really good at this. You, you could go to art school. And I looked at her like, there's a school where you can go to do this stuff all the time. So sign me up. You know, I had no idea. I didn't even know there was such a thing as an art school. You know, so. Uh, for me, it just kind of fell into it, like Patricia said, when we went to college, you know, after the first foundation year, uh, I also was told, uh, you know, you're not a painter, you're a graphic designer, so it was kind of fell, but I had no clue what graphic design was, so never even heard of it, so, yeah. In the back in there? Uh, do you prefer working with print or digital? Yeah, we like both. You know, there's pros and cons to both. Um, I think for print, um, the whole tactile quality is great, you know, like if you get a, like when we did that photography book, you know, it comes in this big solid book and it smells good and all that kind of stuff and <laughs> you just don't get that in, a, in an interactive piece. But then in, a, in an interactive digital piece, like if you make a mistake in a print piece, 
you're screwed, you're stuck with it, that's it. You know, it's printed, it's done. Whereas interactive piece, you can make mistakes and you can just change them on the fly. And, and I do think like... Um, we have lots of discussions about yeah, this. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree with all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is true that certain kinds of technologies we're getting a little bit um, wary of. I think like we have been doing a lot of WordPress, um, CMS projects, websites. And they're getting a little bit tedious, you know, to be honest, because I think the um, the creative aspect of them is not as fun as, as it used to be, I think. But we are, you know, we are exploring, uh, like the iPad app that we're, do that we're doing. That's great. That's a lot of fun. A lot more flexibility there. Uh, that interactive piece at the end that we showed you, that was a lot of fun. So we are trying to um, push the technologies in a different way. But there is pros and cons to it. I think one thing about technology that's always tough is that you, um, most of the times when, you do, when somebody asks you to do a project, you've more than likely never done it before. Or you ask, you're being asked to do things that have never been done before, or you've never done before. So you're always kind of working in the dark a little bit. And then if it's a big project, you're going to be working with lots of different people. So you have to depend on those people to do their job as well. So it gets very complicated. And if somebody drops the ball, and one part of it, then the ripple effect is you get affected and the client gets affected. So we have found that with the digital projects, because they are so collaborative, there's a lot more people involved and there's probably more room for things to go wrong. But when it works, it's great, you know, but it's, uh, it is more complicated, that's for sure. And the technologies are changing so much, as you, as you guys know. Like, you know, now when we design a website, it has to work. You know, not only on the desktop it has to work on an iPad, it has to work on an iPhone or you know a Droid phone. So it's all these different things you have to think about. So it gets it gets pretty complicated. But I still love the digital realm stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. There's a phone, uh, microphone coming. I can hear you. I mean, it's up to you. Uh, well, they need to hear it on. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. No. You have to talk loud. Oh. I don't think it's on. Okay. Um, I'm just curious about, um, you said that your life's like, philosophy is to live creatively. Mm -hmm. um, and understandable like when you're in the um, workforce for it to be a little bit difficult to get into that headspace. So what are things um, like as individuals that you kind of feed your imagination with? With, um, well for me it's, um, it's seeing art, it's um, photography, it's illustration. If I come to that point where um, I'm finding that work is not doing it, um, well, number one, because it's our own studio, we have to ask a question and step back and say, okay, this is not working. We need to change the direction we're going in or add another direction because we can't have a studio that's not creative, we know that. Um, but when we were in the workforce and working for, say, corporate America, um, it, it, it was difficult. Um, and what we did was I got involved with another project, the magazine, that, um, you know, that helped me with creativity because it was all experimental. I could do, you know, it was, it was a, group of, a group of us that were um, working on it together for the first time in publishing. So it brought together you know, a great creative atmosphere. But even if it's not a group of people, um, doing photography does that for me. Um, doing illustration does that for me. Uh, it's looking to different avenues to explore your creativity. Because you're, you're probably good at more than one thing. You just have to find out what those areas are and where, what you can develop. Mm -hmm. But it's important that you do it. Because if you don't, and you're working at something that's like a brain killer, it, it affects other parts of you too. So you always have to make sure that you create that you keep those creative juices going. Yeah, I, I, and I like to. Um, I guess I like to do something that's totally different from design. Like I like to paint every now and then. I do a lot of writing, uh, and I find like sometimes if I'm stuck in a design kind of thing, if I just do something completely different like writing or painting or doing music, it kind of unlocks that, that the kind of one feeds off the other. Um, and I'm always, always looking out for 
um, some new uh, digital inspiration. For example, you just, I, maybe you guys have heard this already, but I just came across a game the other day called Never Alone. Have any of you guys seen that? It's just it's made for uh, PlayStation and it's and it's based on um, Eskimo uh, folk tales. It's really awesome looking. So, but things like that, you know, that there's enough, you wouldn't think that you could get inspiration from that. But when you look at this game, it's like, oh, it's just so gorgeous looking. So, and I, I like to look at things through, like painting, for example. I like to go to uh, galleries and just look at paint, uh, painting or sculpture. I do, you know, something that's not connected directly to um, design. Old bookshops still do it yes, for Yes, uh, old books, yeah, definitely. Good. Great. Well, thank you. Please give me a